of the kid like you would a rabbit. This is what the guy, how the guy explained to me. Mm-hmm. Like if you shot a rabbit, you grabbed it by its hind legs and stood there in front of you shaking it, it would it's like a rag doll. Well, this invisible Sasquatch, and that's what he labeled it as, uh, was trying to say to his kid, here, take the deer. And he went closer to the kid each time, putting the deer out in front of him, but the kid got so scared, he, he was going to pull up and shoot where that was, but he didn't really feel threatened, because even though it was an odd, extremely odd situation of this invisible Sasquatch doing this, uh, he didn't know that, you know, if they were friendly or not, and uh, he just thought to himself, gee, only something like a Sasquatch could do that, but this is invisible, so what's this about, you know? Right. He was totally confused. But he finally turned and ran, I mean, and started screaming and yelling for his dad because he was freaked out. Uh, he, of course, he never did get the deer because he didn't stay there long enough to wait. And, uh, you know, he couldn't have blame him, but this is, Again, another situation, and uh, th- he said, my son doesn't lie, and he certainly didn't lie. He was so damn scared uh, during this whole episode, and he was swearing like crazy even, you know. Uh, I, he said, and he said, stop swearing, you know. He said he normally doesn't, never heard his son swear, but he was so scared, he was just, you know, rambling on and on. Uh-huh. So these are some of the things that people come up to me and talk about. Another man came up to me down in San Jose, and he waited till there were people, no one around, and he said, well, there's Sasquatch on my property, and, and they talk to me periodically. He says, you're right. He says, there are people. And he says, I don't know why people want to shoot them or pretend that they're just animals. He said, there are people. Right. He said, I'll tell you that right now. He said, you're right in what you're saying. Yeah, and I friend. asked him about I said, well, you should read my book. There's more information. He says, I already did. He said, I've got a copy at home, and I read, you know, my book, The Psychic Sasquatch, and he says, that's ex- everything you said is exactly what he had experienced, he told me. And he was a man, I guess, somewhere between uh, 55 and 60 years old, very serious-minded and, and a very kind and normal person. Yeah. So, you know, uh, again, we have to, researchers have to wake up and stop being so infantile and how they deal with things, and educate themselves in this area. It's very important if they want to have experiences. You know, uh, I wanted them to have experiences years ago. I don't care anymore. They're too busy criticizing, and, uh, well, I'm too busy going out into the field. My, right. I'll be finished with my new book by December, which is called The Sasquatch People, and that'll be out in January or February. Okay, great. Uh, now, speaking of the Bay Area UFO uh, Expo, uh, you reveal some new footage of Sasquatch uh, that's getting some very high marks from a lot of the people who actually viewed it, uh, who were talking about it on the forum, and that they actually uh, said it was the uh, best footage they have seen outside of the uh, Pat- Patterson footage. And uh, that it was actually three films. You had so much footage. They were just amazed that they hadn't seen it before since there was so much hoopla over this Manitoba Bigfoot video recently that was pretty much blurry and, you know, yeah, it had, didn't really make much out of it. Right. It's too bad that it came out blurry like that. Right, right. It was probably a real, real experience, but, uh, but you know, it's not real meaningful. But uh, they were saying that your footage looked pretty clear and, and pretty close up and that... The movement of the uh, Bigfoot was really fluid as it jumped over a fence. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, uh, where was this? T- where was this footage taken, and when? It was taken down in, in Texas, and I can't comment on it right now. Okay. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I right now uh, have to keep that uh, confidential. The rest of the information. Okay. I'm, I'm working on some things right now. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I have to right now uh, uh, keep this in, in more confidential. But it was taken in Texas, and uh, it's legitimate footage. I mean, it's great footage. Right. Uh, a few years back, uh, you were diagnosed with terminal liver cancer, and you wouldn't be here probably if it weren't for uh, the help of Sasquatch and 
and the ET connection, I want to get around to what, what the UFO connection is with, uh, with Sasquatch also. Okay, well, let me uh, uh, just say that I've, uh, yeah, I feel privileged because of this stuff has happened, and, you know, uh, uh, my, some of the, my experiences are far more advanced and more frequent than uh, the average everyday person. But, again, I, my attitude is different. Uh, I'm not trying to exploit them and so forth. And this is important to understand. So uh, the ego, especially the male ego, can be very powerful, very strong, and actually, de- in this case, detrimental to the, to the Bigfoot research. Uh, so, uh, but with the ETs, uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I was very ill. In fact, I was dying, and uh, I had just moved to Arizona and was living in Flagstaff at that time and uh, I visited a medicine woman down in Sedona and uh, it got late I can recall it was quarter to 12 I still remember and this was in January of 1991 and uh, uh, she said don't drive back she said why don't you stay in my guest room she said it's just too late and too you look tired i was yawning a lot so i agreed and i stayed there and as soon as i shut off the lights in the room there were uh four six and a half foot tall kachinas standing at the foot of my bed i mean this really confused me and the kachinas are really et's and they're a race of et's and i don't understand why they look the way they do. They certainly were not scary at all, but their feathers I could hear rustling, and I could hear, be- hear bells at the around their ankles as they shifted their weight. And uh, they stayed there for 50 minutes talking to me and explaining to me a lot about my life and the importance of some of the work that I'm doing. And they said, you know, uh, if you take these herbs, uh, you will be fine. So uh, uh, two days later, I collapsed, and uh, I started sleeping about 16 hours a day, 15 to 16 hours every day, and I spent uh, five and a half weeks in bed. And uh, uh, after that, I th- they couldn't find any cancer at all. And uh, I took all the stuff they told me to take. So... Uh, later, uh, a couple of weeks after I was well, uh, I was invited onto the Hopi reservation to some traditional people. And it got late, and they also offered for me to stay overnight, that they had an extra room. And uh, so uh, uh, when we were having dinner, uh they asked me about uh, uh, different situations I've had, and I told them. I said, "Well, the, you know, uh, uh, I was visited, you know, by the Kachinas, and they didn't really I th- expect to believe me right then and there. But when I told them how they were standing at the foot of my bed, one was was forward, one was back a, a, a half a step, one was forward, and the other was back about a half a step." And uh, he says, that's how they appear to people. And tears came to this man's eyes. 